the point is, there are very few countries in the world, forget the comparison just to Africa, which, which puts us in a remarkable category on our own continent, but in the world, think of America. The last few elections they've had have been contested in court um, uh, before the president has been uh, declared. Um, uh, that's not a small thing to say, by the way. Uh, that's not a small thing to say. We do democracy and we do it darn well. Also, we have what many people think is the best or one of the best constitutions ever written. Now, there's a reason for that. We were one of the last people to write one. Um, <laughs> possibly should have had one slightly earlier. But the point is, because we were last, we got to pick from the best of all the others. And we put geniuses in charge of writing it, let's be honest. Um, wouldn't it be great if one of those geniuses was still around and could implement... Oh, yes, okay, nice. Here he is. Now, we've mentioned Sir Ramaphosa already, President Ramaphosa. He's been a, in as president now for a, a year and a bit. And if you think he could have done more than he's done in that year, you don't understand politics and you don't understand the ANC. In fact, I would argue that he did more than we could have imagined or hoped for. I'll give you just a few examples uh, from the list. The VAT increase. Some of you forgot about the VAT increase the day after it was announced because you are middle class and it doesn't impact you. So we have to remember that pronouncing a VAT increase was probably the most unpopular thing that an ANC leader could possibly do. And he got pushback from everybody, from all of his constituency, from the labor unions, and he said, no, we have to. We have to get more money into this country, uh, into the government fiscus, and this is the easiest way to do it. We are doing it. Boom. And then he didn't really come after you, uh, middle class people who I'm assuming are, are mainly in the room here. He didn't come after you with massive tax increases last year. He realizes he's pretty much on the edge of where he can do it. That's not nothing, people, a VAT increase. It's not nothing to uh, announce that you're going to break up ESCOM before the elections. What was he doing? I'll tell you what he was doing. He was telling everybody, this is the government you need to elect. We're not playing games anymore, people. This is the government you need to elect. Now, whether ESCOM privatizes any of the bits they break up or not, that's a different story for a different conversation. But breaking ESCOM up is absolutely the thing you have to do. We are the only remaining country in the world that has not broken up the electricity monopoly. Every single other country in the world has moved from the 1960s and 70s model, which ESCOM was built on, and every other country, there's not a single other country in the world that hasn't broken up uh, generation, distribution, uh, transmission. So, as I say, I'm not arguing at this point whether any should be privatized or not. That is where the argument should be. But the breaking it up is absolutely essential. Why did he announce that? Knowing it would irritate Kosatu. Uh, Knowing that, that the labor guys would say, this is nonsense. He, because he's sending all the right signals uh, uh, about what he wants to do, what, uh, what he thinks the government will, will do. We predict that uh, we will be all ha see this afternoon uh, a smaller cabinet. I, we predict that we will, be, uh, that we will like the cabinet um, in terms of the right people in the right places doing the right things. And we predict that the number one priority, which he will announce later this week for each of his key ministry portfolios, is to bring policy certainty. We need to know what's happening with the Telecoms Act. We need to know what's happening with mining. He's already done most of that, which is a, a huge windfall in the carbon tax thing that was announced just last week. Um, he, he will bring tourism, change to the visa regulations and, and a tourism policy. And, and I think you will see over the next six months, by Christmas this year, we will see amazing policy certainty, which is the big thing that foreign direct investors are saying they need. Um, then you will also see something else uh, happen, and that is that the money that is sitting in JSE listed companies, we, we, we did the analysis a few months ago, um, if you look at JSE listed companies and you look at their cash on hand, 
there is more money sitting in JSC listed companies than in the history of South Africa ever. Why? Because everybody's holding their breath. When is it the right time to exhale? Now. This is, this is going to happen uh, over the next few months. So, government, a little bit bruised, definitely not broken.